Well, the original iteration of Brain Games was a three-part special. It wasn't a full series, and it was something that was tried on the network and unexpectedly rated really well. And they were like, I think we have something here. Maybe we should do a full series, bring on a host, refresh the format. And at the time, I had, I had been one year out of current TV, which was Al Gore's TV station. And uh, I had sort of renounced traditional media, and I was like, I'm going to do my own thing, my own content, you know, and I was really into, like, TED and, like, the TED conference and futurism and technology and optimism. And I started making videos in a format that I called the Philosophical Espresso Shot, which was a two-minute invigorating idea dense explosion in your head, right? And you could call it like a sort of an art film about ideas or a trailer for awe. And uh, my goal was to reset the consciousness of the viewer temporarily, arrest their attention for two minutes and, and give them, you know, if we think of media as a drug, I think a lot of media settles for being a narcotic that stupefies and mildly entertains. But I think the best media is mind expanding, is a mind expanding drug that catalyzes the imagination and makes you see the world anew. And so I started making these self-produced non-commercial videos and they started getting really popular through Twitter and YouTube and Vimeo. And I got a lot of write-ups. The Atlantic called me the Timothy Leary of the viral video age, which was awesome because I really like Leary, particularly his proto-futurism stuff that he came out with in later in life. And, uh, and so what happened is I, all of a sudden this new life happened. All of a sudden I was on demand, in demand as a speaker talking about the future in the sort of, I spoke at the TED Global stage. I did keynotes for IBM and Intel and all this travel. And all I was doing was talking about stuff that I was geeking out on. And I just happened to be, I guess my enthusiasm made the ideas resonate with audiences. And because I always thought these ideas were amazing, you know, but I never thought of myself as an expert, you know, but somehow it, it I became one, I guess, and uh, at least an expert communicator. Um, and then, so all this was happening, and then National Geographic, the showrunner, was familiar with my work, and they were like, you know, we're turning this into a series, we're looking for a host, and up. Do you want to do it? And I was like, well, let's, yeah, let's try it. It was supposed to be a three-month gig, and almost two years in, you know, we have the highest-rated show in the history of Nat Geo. We're finishing 20 episodes, so it's been a great ride. Oscar, I mean, Emmy nomination not Oscar nomination, Emmy nomination, for Outstanding Informational Series or, or Special, which is great. And, um, and so that's kind of been the journey now. From what I gather, it seems to be resonating everywhere. Like in the UK, it premiered immensely well, and then we keep hearing, we had all this press in other countries. I'm doing some interviews with South Africa tomorrow. So I think it has an evergreen, universal, post-geographic, post-regional uh, appeal. And uh, that's kind of cool. Maybe it's because science is universal and maybe I can sort of stand in as a kind of international composite human because I'm from Venezuela, but then I'm Jewish, but then I'm a futurist and I live in the U.S. and so. I sort of, I think that maybe that has a cross-national uh, appeal, maybe, hopefully, that has helped the show. You know, I've, I'm doing a lot of the stuff in Spanish, interviews in Spanish, in Latin America, in Spain. I did a whole thing in Spanish as well, so I think maybe that helped as well. Yeah, I mean, I think the main sort of where the show's format separates itself from other factual or reality programming is that it is a fully participatory show. We talk to the audience, we give instructions to the audience to play along, to participate, to hopefully experience viscerally the science. You know, the games are a means to an end. The games are engagement devices to make you learn by doing, which is the best way to learn. So if we're able to teach people about how their perceptions and misperceptions of reality work, how the brain interprets the signals coming into it through the senses and builds reality with that by showing you these games that highlight that, um, that's pretty cool. We work with brain experts, actual cognitive lab guys that know what they're doing, and we adapt real experiments and work closely with them to make them TV friendly. So how do we make this visual? How do we make this something that we can have volunteers play along with, but also the audience play along with? And, you know, there's a talented team of writers and producers that work very closely with these guys and build the show.
Whenever you have a takeaway in which you are reminded that reality or that your perception of reality is malleable, that you don't really have an empirical objective experience of reality outside of the laboratory, all you have is your subjective experience. And your subjective experience means you know, your brain is constructing the world on the fly with limited information. It's getting through the senses. It's completing that information with, by making inferences, by completing the patterns, you know, often erroneously. You also bring to all experiences mental templates. You bring expectations. You bring intent, agency. All these things inform, color your experience. And so really the idea that, that, that what we call reality for every one of us is kind of a co-production and that your brain is actively involved in that co-production. Uh, in a way has an exhilarating freedom to it because it means, oh, maybe I can have a say in how my life unfolds, right? It becomes almost like a bumper sticker takeaway, but it's this idea that you can be a co-author in your experience and things are not set in stone. And I think that's kind of liberating. We do little, little tidbits in which I kind of muse about the ideas uh, explored in each episode. And they're sort of modeled on the short form content that I'm known for on the web. Um, we do them a little less manic, um, just because we want to make sure everybody can follow along. But um, yeah, so we do these little interviews with me that are edited with sort of stock footage and imagery to go along with the concepts that I'm exploring. So we do that, and then we have interactive experiments on the Brain Games website. I have uh, social media, Twitter, a lot of Twitter, Facebook page is very popular. So yeah, we try to get everybody through all the screens. I think it's just that we are going to have better filters needed to address the onslaught of content competing for the limited resource of our attention. So I'm going to become an attention elitist, which means I'm going to be very, very selective about who gets my attention and where I place my attention. Because otherwise, I am, you know, the platforms start to become attention vampires because everybody wants your attention and they're all competing and they don't care that you get banned with anxiety because they're just like, watch me, watch me, watch me, watch me. And you know, you start to become like a fragmented being who's like watching a little bit of nothing or a little bit of everything, but a lot of nothing, right? Um, and so I think the future is that there will be new tools to create exceptional curation, which means your mediated universe will be a la carte and built just for you. So in my case, I'm excited because it means there's going to be a lot of dazzling content for me to look at every day and nothing will ever be boring because it will be so exceptionally curated for my taste. Um, so I'm excited about that. <laughs>